Last time you were on the show, we went deep into your whole oral care routine, toothpaste you're using, toothbrush, floss. We went really deep. We got into all the nuance. For people that are interested in that, which I highly recommend going back and listening or watching that, let's give people just the general overview. We won't get into the detail we got into last time, but give people an idea who haven't tuned into that conversation yet, your general oral care routine, and maybe some things have changed in the last number of months too. So give us, give us a few minutes on what the current practice is. Sure. Uh, This is something that everyone wants to know, and I'm happy to go through it and whatever details required. Um, Big picture is that the industry that is selling you products for oral care, and I, and I include the profession of dentistry as well. Um, there are a lot of dentists that sell products. There are a lot of non-dentists that sell products. There are big corporations that sell products. And most of this is based on junk science or no science. Um, and we it's been that way for the last century. Um, and, you know, if you buy something at Target and it's a, a major brand, it could be a Procter & Gamble product, it could be a... Uh, Glasgow Kine product, uh, Lever Brother. These are all the big companies: Colgate, uh, Crest. Uh, these are these are toothpaste that appear on that shelf for about thirty, forty cents, boxed. You know, uh, all the marketing's been done, and they sell it to you for four to five dollars, uh, and they contain fluoride. Uh, these are products that are based on. Again, I'm not going to use the word science, but on a notion. And, and falsehoods that have been around for a hundred years, and and dentistry has been behind them. I mean, it, we're not we're not gu- not guilty of of being part of this. So so the first thing you want to do with oral care, whether it's brushing, flossing, tongue scraping, uh, using mouthwash, using toothpaste, is you have to make sure that your products are oral microbiome friendly. Again, the oral microbiome was discovered or defined uh, in uh, late, you know, the, uh, the, the 2010s, uh, like 2008, 2009, uh, maybe 2005, 2006. And so it's a recent thing. And, and how long does it take for an industry to react to that? Well, the profession is just now getting on the bandwagon. I'm, I'm seeing some change. Uh, we've been literally proselytizing, preaching this on ask the dentist for about 10, 12 years and, and, and our, 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 our major, uh, kind of comment was it's going to take 10 to 20 years for this to change. And, and that's the difference we see between the latest studies and when it gets the Delta between the latest information in the studies and when it gets incorporated into a medical or dental, uh, uh, curriculum. It's not in the, it, it's appearing in the curriculum. It's more in the continuing education and the more kind of, uh, smarter, uh, more the, the practitioners that are question things like, why are all my patients getting gum disease? Why is it so prevalent? Why are all the kids getting cavities? What, uh, what am I dealing with here? They're the ones that are asking this question and they find this information online through continuing education. So your products need to be oral microbiome friendly. Now, having said that, how many products out there are oral microbiome friendly? Very, very few. In fact, it's going to be a boutique product. It's going to be costly. It's going to cost two to three times more than that uh, Colgate or Crest on the market. Uh, We also know that mouthwash, 98, 99% of mouthwash is bad for you. It increases your blood pressure. It affects NO production. It also increases your insulin sensitivity. Uh, amazing that we didn't know this. That study has, those studies, the first study is as early as I think 1997, a whole bunch, uh, there were a few in 2005, 2006, and now we're seeing a lot more. So don't use mouthwash, scrape your tongue instead. There's nothing wrong with scraping your tongue. Use a tongue scraper. That is the wide tongue scraper. Don't use a toothbrush. It takes too long, doesn't work very well. And brush twice a day. But don't brush right after a meal. Uh, you got to take care of your oral microbiome uh, and use the right products. Use products that have prebiotics in them, L-arginine, for example. They have no emulsifiers, no surfactants. A lot of toothpaste companies say they don't have surfactants in it. They've replaced it with a, a new surfactant that has a different name. So know your surfactants. 
Um, these are products that are in toothpaste designed just to help make big batches and it actually thins and makes your oral mucosa more permeable. It predisposes you to uh, canker sores. It has other effects. It can be bactericidal. Um, and, uh, and then stay away from essential oils. Essential oils are actually were being added as a preservative to help preserve uh, and make the product smell and look desirable. Um, stay, they're, they're bactericidal. They have an effect on the oral microbiome. So really, your toothpaste should should be something much different than probably what you're used to. That requires some research. There's plenty of information on the web. There's a lot of misinformation on the web. We won't get into that or we can talk about that later. But keep it simple. E if you eat well, if you keep your mouth closed, don't, and you've got the right pH of saliva, you're really not going to have to focus too much on all of these, uh, uh, on this regimen. There, there is no magic bullet. Flossing is important. Uh, I would not use a nylon floss that has PFAS in it. We've been saying that for years. We, we refer to it differently, microplastics, nylon breaking off in the mouth. Now we have different names for it. Stay away from that stuff. We have silk floss, which is biodegradable. We do have safer, softer toothbrushes. Replace your toothbrush often. Nylon bristles are abrasive. Make sure you're brushing correctly. No back and forth sawing motion, jiggling, massage the gums. There are lymph channels in your gums. You do want to massage the gums with a toothbrush. You can also use the tip of your finger if you want. Floss. Uh, there are new flossers out, electric flossers, that are absolutely amazing. I do recommend one, which I absolutely can't believe how good it is uh, in terms of benefit and results. And then use the right toothpaste. And in general, stay away from mouthwash. Even if it's salty water or flavored, you know, safely, just clean water, you can just use clean water. You don't have to go out and buy a mouthwash. So, um, and then scrape your tongue. Scraping your tongue is something you definitely want to do. That has major benefits for the oral microbiome. So none of the mouthwashes that are commercially available you'd use? I wouldn't. I mean, the really healthy organic ones, I mean, you're paying for something. I, I would spend it on the toothpaste. Um, mouthwash is, is intermittent. It's just, it, it goes quickly. Now, if you have a very dysbiotic oral microbiome and you are very sick and you've got rheumatoid arthritis, you've got heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's runs in your family and your gums are bleeding and you have bad breath and you have high decay rate, you're going to need an aggressive mouthwash and dental work and other things all at once to reset the oral microbiome. And that would, that would be for a period of two to three weeks to reset it. You could even be, uh, be put on antibiotics, aggressive antibiotics. And, and that's a very sad state. But, I mean, some of us are there and, and we need that. You can't say no mouthwash at that point. But daily use of mouthwash, complete waste of your time. Time is valuable. Complete waste of your counter space. That can be valuable in certain households. Depends on how many kids you have. And, and also uh, money. I mean, and if it's causing high blood pressure and affecting your resistance or insulin resistance, why would you even take that chance? And there's no therapeutic benefit from it. Uh, you could have a few essential oils and, and it's just a waste of time. Even the essential oils are bad. And I've, I know a lot of people that have burned their mouths with very healthy, natural homeopathic mouthwashes. Again, the action of liquid is only as good as stabilizing pH quickly because you're, you're adding a, high pH water, hopefully seven or higher. And the minute you add that to water, you're moisturizing the mouth and you're stabilizing the pH very, very quickly. You don't need mouthwash for that. Water, good quality water will do that. You quickly mentioned a salt water wash. Is that ever a good idea for people? It sounded like it wasn't, but I'm picturing somebody with canker sores or some kind of, you know, gum bleeding I could picture in those cases, probably no, other right. cases like that, that yeah. using a saltwater wash would be helpful. Absolutely. I recommend it. Um, I recommend a super saturated solution of salt water. Pick the highest quality salt you can. I like the salt from England because it doesn't have microplastics in it. Himalayan salt does. It's called Aldrin? Waldron. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, delightful salt. Stir that into eight ounces of water until you can no longer dissolve it. You still see crystals on the bottom. That means it's super saturated. Um, swish with it. If you have canker sores, as you said, 
um, if you're healing after some surgery, again, talk to your dentist about this. You don't want to really swish a lot. You could cause a dry socket after wisdom teeth surgery, but salt water is wonderful. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very hypertonic solution and it promotes healing. If you have any epithelial damage in the mouth and you need epithelial regrowth, uh, laying in of new tissue, salt water is a good thing. Um, and even if you want to use it, uh, there's nothing wrong with it, using it daily. Okay. So it's not having a negative impact on the microbiome in the mouth. Not at all. Baking soda. Um, I, I'm a big fan of baking soda. It neutralizes things very, very quickly, but I wouldn't use it every day. There could be some interaction between baking soda and remineralization. So, um, and baking soda and toothpaste is probably questionable as well. I haven't completed all my research on that, but there are some signs that that could be interfering with remineralization. You mentioned this rebrand on surfactants. It sounds like in the natural toothpaste. What is that term we're looking out for now? Well, the the uh, SLS uh, was the the term for a long time, sodium lauryl sulfate. Now they have coconut derived versions of it. On our website, we have a list of from what we've seen, and we keep having to update it because they keep changing the name. It's like BPA free. Then they just add something else that's just as bad as BPA, um, and you can't pronounce the name. So it's um, it, it's hard to keep track of this stuff. Um, and there are some brands that say they are emulsifier free and surfactant free, and they just added something that is different. So um, it's that's that's a hard hard thing to to deal with and and to watch. But we do have a list of all the names. I think it's fifty or sixty different names. Um, there's so much to worry about and, and to look at before you buy toothpaste, uh, and la label reading and, and all of that. It's, I really feel bad for the consumer. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and people are confused. They really just want the best product and they just, they don't even mind, you know, they're not that price conscious. They just want to know that for the time that they're investing, and these are parents that don't have a lot of time. They're working. They've got kids. Um, it could be a caregiver. I mean, that's brushing her mom's teeth with Alzheimer. They just want to know that they are doing the best they possibly can and that it's safe and that it is efficacious or it has a therapeutic effect. And unfortunately, there are a lot of chemicals put into toothpaste. Toothpaste is an imperfect product by definition. I mean, to make a paste of the things that you want in the mouth, they've added all these other chemicals and, and substances to help keep the state, the, the paste stable and consistent. It's, it's tough. Um, anyway, um, it's, um, really look out for those. Don't underestimate the effect of a surfactant or emulsifier. And again, if your toothpaste is foaming, that's a bad sign. Even, even if they say it's emulsifier free, they have an emulsifier in there and you don't need foaming toothpaste. In fact, there have been ad campaigns decades ago on how my toothpaste foams and how wonderful that is. It's not, <laughs> it's just a byproduct of something that they put in there and they didn't want to alarm the, uh, the end user. So they said foaming is good. When you talked about floss, you mentioned silk floss and then this other new flosser. I'm assuming that's the slate flosser you were raving about last time you're on the show. Yes. I think at that point you'd only been playing around with it for about four months, but you're raving about it. That's still something you're, you're loving. I wish I had invented it. It makes so much sense. I mean, uh, every dentist that knows, you know, that has done gum work. I mean, we all have, uh, they understand the architecture of the embrasure and the call and the way tissue, uh, forms a papillae in between teeth. I mean, this is a very intricate, very unique part of the body. So much can go wrong. So much gets done correctly by the body. If, if we eat the right diet, of course, and treat it well. Um, and this flosser, and I, I hesitate using the word flosser because it's so much more, it's a flosser plus or a super duper floss or whatever. Um, it does flossing really well and it makes it easier it electrifies it. it. It vibrates inside the sulcus, but those little gum sweeps, they call them. It's like a little triangular piece of silicone with little hairs on it. As you guide those through into the embrasure, you literally, it's like a silicone, uh, shovel, triangular it's not even a shovel it's kind of like a scoop that literally if you use it correctly and they have videos online you're literally in one sweep pulling out so much more than if you had just used floss and i always tell people use floss then use the slate flosser 
look carefully, get your glasses on in a well-lit room, you will be amazed what the slate flosser is pulling out after you have f done your normal flossing. So yes, I'm still a big fan. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. We use the word metal, we use the word amalgam, silver fillings, they're all the same. They're half mercury and half silver and they add other alloys in there. So a lot of people are going to their dental offices, they're saying take them all out, it's not being done properly and they just inhale.